on play chess and streaming to youtube okay we're going to carry on this week looking at the fisher's basket 1972 world chess championship and i'm hoping the board is okay by the way on youtube seems okay to me on the preview uh so we come to one of my favorite games of the 1972 match and it has a surprising twist early on and it's Fisher playing white in game six managed to avoid a lot of preparation in this game he played a very surprising first move here in game six he played actually the move c4 if you remember there was a quotation with e4 best by test play e4 but Fisher played c4 I think he had once played this against Paul Gyaski, who drew, managed to draw, and, and was quite proud of that draw against Fischer. So, and there was also another default once, I think, against Pano. But yeah, so twice, I think, he played C4 before this game. So it's a bit of a shock and wasting all the Russian preparation, basically, uh, for his E4. He was thought to have a, you know, a narrow, very strict you know opening repertoire so this was a bit of a shock so Spassky reacted with e6 and the game transposed into a queen's gambit declined soon after knight f3 d5 d4 knight f6 knight c3 and bishop e7 so queen's gambit declined bishop g5 and here quite often h6 is played as well as casting spasky chose the castle e3 okay so here there's two main moves knight bd7 according to the book or h6 again challenging this bishop in fact h6 was played here the bishop just retreated this is the most popular to maintain that dark square bishop just retreating and we have the tartar defense variation now indicated because black played b6 here now the bishop has signaled its intention to go on to this diagonal or usually rather than here maybe that's another alternative sometimes and so it's not going to be using this diagonal and here is where c takes d5 was played so c takes d5 Um, should should so it should be a board boards should be okay by the way so c takes d5 locking down the center and black rarely actually plays e takes d5 the most popular is what was played to keep the, the center more fluid and this diagonal more open in fact Spassky played knight takes d5 here Mike takes d5 okay offering an exchange of bishops let's actually add uh, a kibitzer here as well just to check things out stop fish in the background just want to check things out if needed tactically so we're still in the opening phase of the game where we're coming out of the opening soon uh, so what does white want to do in this position well the usual move is actually to take on e7 here not to say retreat the bishop uh, knight takes d5 is also not commonly used the most common move is to allow the exchange of the dark square bishop so we have bishop takes e7 
and black usually takes with the queen here not knight takes e7 although that has been seen been seen in a handful of games so queen takes e7 so we're getting quite deep into the Tartakoa defense variation yes and here uh, Fischernel plays knight takes d5 so he's locking down this diagonal with making black occupy this diagonal with a pawn and it's actually it was actually quite a trendy variation this had been seen in some topple games before Fischer had been keeping up with the literature the Russian literature and, and the latest trends in this variation which he's never actually played much before but he's he's seen it obviously before and he's playing very topically rook c1 not moving this bishop for a moment so rook c1 starting to put pressure on the queen side bishop e6 was played okay let's here, here let's have a question bishop e6 okay this might be theoretical but it looks a bit weird not to play bishop b7 maybe bishop b7 has been played a little bit 25 times but bishop e6 is is the most often used move let's have a quick look bishop b7 here's an example this queen coming to pin the c5 pawn is the bishop better off on e6 well it's interesting anyway engine has a slight advantage for white here but yeah bishop e6 is actually much more common even though it seems as though b6 you know the bishop was going to go to b7 it actually goes to e6 here and we still see this move we see this move queen a4 black has a problem here with c7 clearly there's a there's a nagging issue with c7 uh, if knight d7 doesn't that just blunder a pawn yes probably even though white's not so developed I don't think black's in a great position to exploit this just yet this could actually be taken and this should be okay for white just about this position should be okay for white so black doesn't want to give up the c7 pawn and he wants to be able to develop the knight so what to do about that pawn rook c8 might be viable that's been played a few times before and actually here's a game continuation bishop e2 uh, and okay it seems as though this might be playable as well okay in in the game c5 was played immediately and we have this pin emerging queen a3 pinning so these hanging pawns this structure with the hanging pawns so the plans for white or any color when, when playing against hanging pawns is often to try and fix them encourage them to commit themselves so you can try and exploit the weaknesses around the, the more fixed pawns with this pin it's slightly annoying pressure here and uh okay how does black react to this again we're, we're well in live book theory actually here black plays rook c8 so this whole routine had been worked out before parking the queen on a3 to pin the pawn uh now here's a, there's a choice bishop e2 has been quite 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 a lot played 58 games or there's bishop b5 21 games Fisher chose bishop b5 okay so what are the issues in this position is it possible that knight d7 might not be a good move in the game we see a6 in luck in this position it's either a6 or queen b7 uh queen queen 7 like 13 games a6 very rarely knight bd7 let's have a quick look at this you might think is that viable Pawn 
possibly it's it's viable as well although this knight d4 might be a nuisance but yeah white's advantage doesn't seem too major but anyway uh yeah a6 was chosen not yet threatening a takes because of the pin but queen b7 will mean the bishop is actually threatened because queen b7 will protect the rook white now captures away from the center d takes c5 so we've got these fluid pawns here and now fisher castles and we see a move which does mean this threat is activated uh, we see rook a7 funny enough another way of activating this threat uh, might be queen b7 or even queen a7 they both activate this a takes but we see rook a7 the bishop drops back now that this is threatened bishop e2 so there's the question again how do we try and fix these uh, hanging pawns that's that's fisher's job Spassky's job is to liberate them maybe create a dangerous pass pawn out of them maybe to sort of create a wedge in white's position to try and attack the white king so there are pros and cons of these hanging pawns we see here now knight d7 and now knight d4 using the pen is knight takes e6 useful for white is that bishop so good uh for white to want to take it okay here is where we see perhaps a logical move to unpin the c pawn but a bit passive looking we see the move queen f8 so black is activating the threat of c takes d4 now but encouraging white maybe to consider taking on e6 before we go on let's have a look at alternatives here knight f6 might keep the queen a bit more aggressively placed and if takes takes there's also a lock on the e4 square with knight f6 maybe it had an advantage in that um this seems to be a bit secure in the center white is stopped from playing e4 the way Spassky has played it is it's actually possible now it creates a resource which maybe should have been locked down by playing queen f8 Fisher actually employs a very interesting idea here now he does take on e6 that seemingly passive bishop and he has a way of trying to lock down these pawns but in such a way which also favors the light square bishop there's no light square bishop for black to counter this bishop on e2 so a fantastic move here and this is for me like a, a symphony on both sides of the board this game it seems queen queen f8 might have been the start of black being a bit passive but a fantastic move here now can you see what white played in this position if one plays chess, can you move to another tab like training tab by the way so white play i hope some of you might not have seen this game so your task strategically is to try and fix down these pawns and maybe at the same time as a bonus could you also try and improve the bishop there's a move here which ticks both boxes so if I gave you 20 seconds what would you play here with white maybe some of you haven't seen this game before it actually represents a very classic a very classic example of play against hanging pawns so you want to try and fix them down and maybe emphasize your other assets in the position at the same time so white's play
I'm so happy that on stream you can't see the score sheet so some of you that haven't seen the game before might think about this okay yeah it's uh, it's an interesting move here which exploits the fact that the knight's not on f6 actually it's actually yes some of you have guessed the move e4 how is this possible what is this how effective is this as a temporary pawn sacrifice black in the game declined the pawn sack he played d4 maybe there's you know some other alternatives which might be lesser evil alternatives like knight f6 maybe but Spassky actually fixed down his pawns uh, like submitting to White's plan it seems if he takes this pawn what happens let's have a look d takes e4 what is White's strongest move here is it to attack the e6 pawn or is it something else interestingly I haven't analyzed this position in great detail except in this point it just looks bad fundamentally of course it looks like a wreck to have the double pawns but I think we should analyze it concretely this position is it Bishop c4 actually the engines are suggesting something else what would you play in this position if black had taken this pawn on e4 what is the actual punishment here white to play i'm just gonna this is this is now getting tricky this is just a variation what was the idea is it really just bishop c4 positionally of course it looks like a wreck I mean it looks as though there should be enough positional compensation should you really have to justify this let's, let's go with Bishop c4 maybe this this is okay for white and in fact maybe you don't need to justify it you just start pressurizing e6 what is black doing protecting that you can put a bit more pressure on e6 or maybe even you can just make it into a gambit f3 how dangerous is this Uh, this looks pretty dangerous if taking maybe it's just a very strong gambit here takes we can take on e6 and then take on f3 that looks like a strong gambit in any case the pawns are wretched that really doesn't want to do this this looks like wretched another move just to put pressure on on the e pawn and again this f3 is actually a useful lever to open up the position maybe even more for this bishop what is black going to do here if he if he takes surely he's getting into big trouble there's a lot of pressure in this position white's going to regain the pawn with advantage the pawns are all pretty splintered so yeah it doesn't seem like a good idea as you'd expect d takes e4 does not seem like a good idea not only can white attack e6 white can attack e4 white can use it as a lever to open the up the position a bit more even he can use it as a and keep keep the pawn sack going maybe one of the better alternatives is knight f6 to try and keep central control what's the problem here e5 is that a problem maybe this is okay white's got a slight space advantage is it totally diabolical for black here maybe not maybe this is better than the game continuation maybe you know black can try and hold on here the bishop is still blunted by this pawn structure here it isn't so fantastic a holiday for the bishop but in the game continuation yeah we see something quite passive actually which i believe has been uh, criticized by certain commentators of the game this bishop is fed some light squares actually d4 was played i think immediately technically the advantage is going up here look at this light square bishop it just will relish these light squares surely 
it's going to relish these light squares uh, but is black's center still mobile potentially isn't bishop c4 possible yeah i think bishop c4 is possible but maybe more accurate is is to play f4 as fisher play this might actually be one of the more accurate moves just immediately stopping any e5 in any case so fisher played this he's trying to fix these pawns this one's a target it's not actually going anywhere you don't need to be in a rush to play bishop c4 if e5 for example then you know we've got this extra hand on the queen don't think this works out very well we can take this then play the check and then crash through if black's taking on e5 this is a very nice position what is black doing here white's already preparing to swing across it looks looks dangerous territory as an example queen h3 or queen g3 it's dangerous territory um so f4 does seem to be preventing e5 so white is in the process of fixing down black's pawns what can black actually do here he seems actually to have a passive game what about moving this knight can the knight move maybe actually f5 is interesting here immediately concretely threatening f takes for the queen attack what does black do here if e5 then that diagonal wins a piece check winning a piece okay gotta be careful about loose pieces so f5 would be strong for this diagonal so yeah black seems to have a limited number of options already in this position it's like the pawn structure is trying to be fixed down you see in a lot of grandmaster games especially adams who's nicknamed spider he's, he's fixing down the opponent's pawn structure on the queen side on the king side he ends up winning an end game but here fisher's fixing down the central pawns what were the hanging pawns they've been more committed here there's a light square bishop ready to do damage and not only this this f file as a new sort of venue for the attack with f5 is coming up to be quite dangerous the black queen steps out of the f file so prepares to meet perhaps f5 with e5 here f5 wasn't played here though maybe it is just met is e5 possible maybe actually but even stronger might actually be just to play knight e5 just holding on to the c4 square that would be okay for black nice blockade square this might actually be even equal for black okay so no need for f5 no the better way is to carry on trying to fix the pawns e5 so there's a lock on the e6 pawn the bishop is not so keen immediately to take that but it's, things are getting prepared for bishop c4 and you can imagine once the bishop's on c4 pinning that pawn then f5 again will be renewed as an interesting possibility can black really stop this bishop c4 plan what if say in this position well, well especially played rook b8 what if he plays knight b6 trying to stop bishop c4 here it's interesting maybe the queen can come like this maybe the bishop's just rerouting potentially over here so this will stop any c4 because that pressure on d4 so here queen here this position is also interesting now for bishop d3 there's some weaknesses around the king here so okay the knight stayed put sorry after e5 the knight stayed put we see rook b8 is this a little bit more of a slide downhill though maybe it was more challenging technically to try and find something else 
it seems as though black is getting into a passive position here uh, so we see bishop c4 the pawn pins now all the being pawn pins uh, so what is black actually uh, doing in this position now in fact the queen is also ready to swing across maybe to g3 or even h3 to put more pressure on e6 so it's pretty dangerous if knight b6 can that bishop be challenged here actually white has an interesting move on knight b6 knight b6 wasn't chosen but there's a move which seems very very strong in this position actually to actually gain material if knight b6 is being played here can you see what white can play here this is just a variation what can white play in this position which is actually really quite good can anyone see this wasn't played <clears throat> there are pins around the place here to make use of interesting interesting fascinating i think some of you might have old analysis for this game actually i think some of you have old analysis for this game or may have been guided by more materialistic commentators they didn't have such powerful engines as now yes a good move might actually be queen take c5 but it might not actually be the best using the pin here of course this seems to win a queen not the queen a pawn so queen takes takes is is material up with actually a big advantage but that technically doesn't seem to be the strongest move actually black might have knight takes c4 here and things get a little bit interesting queen takes is dead equal apparently this position we're losing b2 and if we take on c4 again queen takes b2 sorry rook takes b2 queen takes d4 this position okay white white's better but there's actually an even stronger idea than this position there's a stronger idea than the very forcing looking and spectacular looking queen takes c5 there's actually a stronger idea it seems queen b3 not taking that pawn on c5 but just making use of the, the pinned pawn here and the pin here what does black actually do to avoid dropping e6 here or a pawn in this position can't go and protect this e6 pawn we just drop the knight not this doesn't look good we just take the rook again how do we defend this what here we've got f5 crush there's no way of defending e6 this might actually be stronger than queen takes c5 and i bet you a lot of annotations have queen takes c5 here as 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 the move no actually it seems as though queen b3 is even stronger uh so we might have a position where okay we have this taking this pawn and then what does black do and then we can even swing the queen round and we're looking forward to more stuff now we've nabbed a pawn if rook takes b2 here this is very nice for white this position gaining control of the b file and then maybe the bishop's going to reroute and we've got some pawns here we've got this sort of thing happening and we've got that b file 
So yeah, maybe queen b3 is even stronger, but they're both pretty strong, but queen b3 might be even stronger. So anyway, yeah, knight b6 wasn't played. The bishop unfortunately has to be tolerated here on c4. Unfortunately, what a pain. We can't challenge this bishop with knight b6 because the strongest move might be actually be queen b3. So we see king h8. White has achieved everything he wanted strategically against these hanging pawns. He's fixed them down in the process of fixing them down. He's also mixed in with that improving his light square bishop, an ideal scenario, it seems. And he has this flexibility now. Now that Black's committed himself into the center, it's like White's been given a free hand, so to speak to play on the king's side without counterplay now in the center. These pawns are not so dangerous. Can white simply leisurely go to the king's side here? What about the b2 pawn? Isn't that an issue? Why isn't this an issue? Well, okay. White did just swing the queen over uh, to h3. Another idea is is also to be to be patient. Rook f two first, and and then you know queen g three or something later. Queen h three, okay. But queen queen h three. Let's see. This pawn is attacked. Is this pawn? Can this pawn really be taken? In the game, knight f eight. Another passive looking move is played, just protecting that pawn. What if Spassky had taken on b two here? What is the punishment? Is it really bad? Let's have a quick look. Rook takes b two. Probably, yeah, this is given us an advantage for white technically. You know, bishop takes e6. And then maybe try and get this b5 with rook b1 later. This looked good. Queen f5. Maybe the bishop's going to drop back and go onto this diagonal pretty soon. Bishop b3. Also, e6 is on the cards. We've got some mobile mobile pawns down at e6 on the cards. Saying like f8. Challenge this rook. Well, it's gained some pawn mobility. The bishop's still pretty brilliant on this diagonal. It's, it seems to be very advantageous this position so anyway black didn't take on b2 it's interesting it's actually one of the top engine moves to take on b2 to try and exchange that for e6 exchange of prisoners is an expression Imzovich uses a lot where you have one weakness do you want to trade it for what your opponent's weakness maybe rook takes b2 is technically one of the strongest moves in this position if we try and defend e6 with the rook then white can play b3 okay we're both defending our weaknesses but white stands better here this one and then maybe f5 is coming to try and liberate this pawn or smash through with f6 that doesn't look pleasant at all but it's maybe a little bit similar to the game so maybe this was the chance where you know black should have played rook takes b2 it's getting to be a very difficult position though So Spassky played passively again. Knight f8. A willing passenger. Where is this train going now? Knight just removes his, his temporary issue with b3. And it looks like a beautiful bishop. Not going to be challenged by this knight for the foreseeable future. When is this knight going to crawl out? It's defending e6. And if the bishop's there... Isn't f5 now a permanent threat on the horizon? a5? You might be tempted. Why doesn't white just fix down the a5 pawn with a4 before doing anything else? That's interesting. It wasn't actually played. In fact, f5 was played. Is there something wrong with a4 here, you might ask? Just be a bit patient to shut down the play. I 
I think this is okay as well. So I don't think White's White's assets are not going too far. I mentioned that because I <laughs> Michael Adams, one of the great positional players in the UK, he was actually um he actually came to my um, 18th birthday party. This was many years back. I, I got him to say, you know, you played Sadler. You just lost the Sadler. He had just lost the Sadler and was really annoyed. He was actually depressed. And he was black, I think, against Sadler. And he said, you know, Sadler didn't even play A4, just stopping my counterplay. He was like annoyed he lost to someone who didn't play a routine move to stop counterplay. I think that's why I'm mentioning it now. You know, if you if you've got an option just to shut down the opponent's counterplay before carrying on, but of course you're creating weaknesses here. It does it does mean the b4 square is a bit of a weakness. But yeah, I, I can't see what's wrong with a4. It's just not mentioned by by engines at all. What is wrong with a4? Does anyone have any suggestions? So I'm being pedantic here. Why why why? I'm going to pose a question. Why is a4 so bad here? Why can't you play a4 before doing anything? Is black is black somehow getting out and dancing from this position? You know, he's tied down to the e6 pawn. Why is a4 so bad? The b3 wings, what, are you going to sacrifice in exchange? Really? Isn't the bishop holding b3? Isn't the queen holding b3? It doesn't seem such a loss of time. But on the other hand, what is black actually doing with a4, a, b? Is that a file of great significance? Maybe not. Maybe that's the point. Okay, so anyway, the engine choices here. Well, f5 was played by Fisher, and that, that is that is one of the strongest moves. Uh, engine indications move the rook and maybe double the rooks, maybe put more more power behind the f5 break. But f5 was played immediately. Okay, does it need the extra power? Do you need to double up rooks? f5 was played immediately. In fact, black has no time, of course, for a4. Here, his king's going to be shredded apart. That's one technical reason why black can never really threaten a4 in this position. He's got to deal with the king side here immediately. If he plays a4, he actually took on f5. He's going to be completely shredded, isn't he? With f6. That's a concrete thing about this position. You can't play a4 and try and use the queen side. The king's going to be torn apart here. Say queen d8. This looks like a very strong position. Looks really dangerous. This can't be tolerated. Uh, so yeah, no, Spassky doesn't want that position with a pawn on f6. Now he takes on f5. Rook takes f5 and white is again threatening actually to double now with a concrete you know rook f7 coming in or other pressure so I don't think there's actually any time for this a4 here there's just no time for it surely let's have a quick look in the game knight h7 was played what are black's choices here <laughs> Amusingly, the engine's top choice is actually to play a4 rather than knight h7. See, I told you the a pawn should have been locked down. It's the engine's top choice to play a4. Why does this move even exist? Let's have a quick look. a4, does black get punished? Rook cf1, rook f7 coming. Dissolve this, does it matter? It's still a very strong position for white, this position here. With rook f7 quite dangerous but anyway knight h7 was played and white has the luxury of doubling the rooks which is a great thing to do you want to keep the bishop pair and ideally you want to double your rooks and have the opponent's rooks not so double as 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 uncooperative as possible so white looks rooks look like fantastic team effort here is going on with these four pieces in this position. The concrete threat 
the more concrete threats might include e6 maybe building pressure with queen g3 then maybe e6 we've got also access on this diagonal so things are starting to look pretty dangerous we see queen d8 the queen steps back and now queen g3 putting more pressure to bear and there's some possibilities like e6 opening up the queen on this diagonal this is a runaway pawn all of a sudden the queen and bishop here are still keeping a lock on this d-pawn so white has achieved extra pawn mobility you could argue as well as having a better minor piece that bishop against the knight so white stands strategically better you could say black is in fact strategically lost to some extent he's without too much counterplay here we see rook e7 and now depriving the poor knight of even g5 as a possibility h4 is played which also means there might be extra effect in this rook f7 because g7 what do you do about g7 without any knight g5 this looks more menacing for black's king now rook f7 on the cards so black tries to defend these two squares now the knight's defending f8 the queen's defending f8 but rook f7 is on the cards black plays rook bb7 double defense and now we see e6 so opening up the queen also now there's some extra possibilities emerging rook d5 for example kicking the queen could be useful rook takes c5 is another possibility immediately after this e6 so black does want us to actually not lose the c5 pawn here so he actually plays rook bc7 now powerful looking centralizing move in this position is played looks intuitively very powerful to centralize the queen queen e5 does it actually concretely threaten much at the moment not quite yet but it gives extra flexibility for this sort of naughtiness to happen on this diagonal we see queen e8 yes black's pretty passive now fisher locks down the poor a5 pawn <laughs> he plays a4 now at move 33 finally yes lock down all the pawns not just these two why is this one not suffering everything's locked down the knight's locked down as well these pawns maybe need to be locked down maybe with h5 later or not if we play h5 we give the knight a sigh of relief maybe access to g5 so what is black doing here he waits Spassky waits he's reduced to waiting moves now he moves his queen back to where it came from queen d8 and we see a waiting move for white i think this has to do with the time control actually getting to move 40 to get some extra time so we see this move rook one f2 a waiting move what is black exactly doing he doesn't dare to play d3 surely so black has to repeat if black plays d3 this is no good this this d pawns are gone surely rook d2 and that's a gone for black he's going to be losing that pawn he can't do that so he sits and waits he repeats with his queen queen e8 how is white going to improve white wanting to get to the time control move 40 i think so there's a bit of repetition here at this moment and now finally okay fisher goes into action a bit more funny enough in this position this is again technology making very interesting resources available immediately conveniently fisher played bishop d3 here yeah bishop d3 
this position looks already believe it or not winning from engine eyes bishop d3 is a very very good move and some obvious ideas like this battery but there's actually a move which is incredibly uh, rated much more uh, aggressively in this position so we have a quick indulgent exploration white's play here so bishop d3 was played can you see anything else which might be interesting in this position for white we've got black where we want him surely we've tied black down we've demobilized black's hanging pawns we've even fixed the a5 pawn we've crippled the knight we've centralized our pieces we've parked our bishop we've created a passed pawn which is just about blockaded but there's a fantastic move here as well as bishop d3 it seems any ideas as well as bishop d3 what would be considered a fantastic move scientifically In fact there's very there's a large number of very good moves because black's so tied down it might not be the greatest shock in the world that there's a load of fantastic moves in this position already available to white white has done the positional damage strategically bust your opponent first and then a wealth of fantastic moves should become available to you lots of roads leaving leading to rome um someone's mentioned g4 i'm not sure about g4 Let's, let me just check g4 that wasn't the move I was thinking, but even G4 is a good move, actually. Yeah, you might even have the threat of G5. It's, see, even a move like G4 might actually be good. The engine suggestion is interesting, actually. It's indicating that this move is almost plus 11, believe it or not, rook H5. And it's not a move I've ever analyzed before, but it's giving this move as plus 11. There's a concrete threat, a rook takes H6 here. What does black do about this? This is just a scientific investigation at this point. What does black do about rook h5? Does he move his king away? Then rook g3. It looks as though the two rooks and the queen are conspiring here for something very naughty. And the bishop. What does black do here? You know what? This is given as a forced mate, this position. A forced mate in 11. I don't know if anyone knew that about this position. But yeah, rook h5, believe it or not, king g8 is a forced mate in 11. It's just indicated this is a forced mate in 11, this position here. Um... I've not seen this before. Now, the computer I'm running on, by the way, is an i7. It's a new i7. I actually got it for rendering videos and streaming quicker. I, I didn't realise it would find a force weight in 11 in this position. <laughs> I have to show you that. Unfortunately, I've just lost it now. It's having to rebuild its view that this is a force weight in 11. Ah, oh, my word. rook g3 hold on a sec let's put in rook g3 so queen e8 i'll show you a full state in 11 now rook takes h6 king here this is a full state in 10 bishop d3 
here, rook g5, with this coming up. Yes, you can see that things have gone wrong for black's king now. Everything seems to be thrown at black's king. c4, bishop takes, and you see it's a false, it's actually a forced mate, like this. Check, check, takes. It's a mate in two now. Yeah, it, it actually calculated it to be a force mate in 11, this move rook h5. And yes, that was fun. I, I just, It just shows how crushing the position already was. That there's actually like, but nearly, this this is getting nearly a, a forced mate after rook h5. If king g8, this is actually a forced mate virtually after rook g3. Because if you look at it, this pawn is ready to roll with the check. These rooks have conspired. This is pretty pretty bad news for black. So queen e8 is a forced mate in 11. Queen f8 is a forced mate in 10. King h8 is a forced mate in 9. It goes in that order. If king h8, for example, I'll show you the forced mate in 9. Rook g6. With this idea. Taking here. Yes, good coordination takes and you can see it's going to be a forced mate in six here actually i don't need to show you the forced mate in six do i okay so yeah this this seems to be an absolute forced mate so it turns out that actually fisher's move bishop d3 which when i first annotated this game a few years ago looked like a really neat idea just to get this battery going intuitively but in fact it seems rook h5 is technically a wipeout unbelievable it's a wipeout move. What does black do here? Any suggestions after rook h5? Come on, defend after rook h5, and I'll show you. Defend after rook h5. Come on, throw me some defences. If you don't think this is nearly a forced mate in 11. Anyone? Go for it. Knight f6? Do you want to play knight f6? Oh, this is going to be cracked. There's a force mate in 6 here. You, you've speeded it up. Rook takes f6. It's absolute murder. So he takes check. So here, rook takes. Here, queen takes d8, checkmate. Yeah, knight f6 doesn't do anything. The best to slow things down might be to try and sack the pawn. Actually, might be out of forced mate territory. Set the pawn. But anyway, okay, sorry. Just got an aside there. Anyway, so in the game, it's already a pretty crushing position strategically. We've established that. So we're getting into technical details here for the finest you know, technical implementation. But yeah, bishop d3 seems entirely logical with the idea of queen e4, just a simple battery to mate on h7. Why not mate on h7 here? So black's in a pretty helpless position. He plays queen e8 again, and this battery is constructed. With white now threatening, well, what is white now threatening? Um, what do you think white is threatening here? What is white threatening? If white was given another move, what would white do in this position? What would you say? Yeah, rook f8 is the threat. So say black did did, did a nothing move. We've got rook f8. Just taking the knight away. Rook takes, extinguishing the knight's defense of h7. And then queen h8, 7. 
Queen H7 is checkmate. Ouch. So Spassky is in a totally lost position, of course, here. He plays knight f6. Fischer crashes through with an exchange sack. It's not really a sacrifice. It's such a dominating, it's a clear cut win. After rook takes f6. <clears throat> He's got a pawn for the exchange. This pawn is protected. And he's now threatening things like queen e5 and queen f4. Both of these are entirely destructive moves. Black is without defense here. He tries king g8. Spassky tries king g8. White can just could have just taken on h6 there's lots of moves which which win here but first actually he plays bishop c4 which is an, a very very strong move and after king h8 because black's kind of paralyzed with this move you know if the rook moves we've got e6 e7 is check you know if the rook moves We've got e7 check. This is a mate in four, so it paralyzes black. You know, because then we can take here, and we're actually threatening mate here. Queen g6, mate. Queen h7, mate. Queen g4, mate. So this is a paralyzing move going behind the pawn. It's paralyzing black. So Spex is totally helpless. King h8. And the final move of the game, queen f4. Black resigns here. With the loss of the h6 pawn, that's it. He's going to get mated. It's not just equaling on material. He's going to get mated here. Let's see how... This is move 41. Of note, Spassky is such a gentleman. And, and this is what Fisher remembers very clearly. You know, he, he stood up. And started applauding Fisher as well as the audience. Uh, a fantastic gentleman. I think this was the game. Spassky started applauding. It was it was a, a symphony. This game. It was play on both sides of the board. But um, let's look at the final position. If Queen G8, Queen E5, threatening mate with the discovered check. If rook h7 here, then e7 hitting the queen. And that's over, really. Uh, black's pretty desperate here, so he takes. Then check, the discover check is crushing. And we take here, that's mate there. It's neat yeah so there's no real defense here um as you might expect by this stage yeah queen g8 queen e5 is pretty crushing what does black do in this position rook g7 we can just take here we can at least win the queen if we wanted it's hopeless What does black do in this position? Have you got any any defensive questions from this position? Any defensive queries here? It's, it's resignable. It's what does black do? If he moves the rook back, you know we, we've just got this double check and mate basically on the cards. It's double check and mate, which needs to be defended. Yeah. So this is okay. So just go back to get rid of the moves I just added. So it was in this final position, queen f4, black had resigned. So I think I was showing you queen g8. Queen g8, there's also, sorry, queen g8 here, there's rook f8. Yeah, so it's it's pretty pretty helpless. 
So where did this go wrong? Well, black just increasingly got a passive position with the hanging pawns. The hanging pawns in this variation are supposed to be quite dangerous. They're not supposed to be locked down so badly. Why it's not supposed to have such a fantastic bishop, light square bishop on c4. Black played a series of passive moves. And I think most interesting was when he you know, didn't play knight f6, he allowed white that e4 move, which led to the hanging pawns being fixed, that e4 temporary pawn sack move, which couldn't be taken. Once the hanging pawns were fixed, white had a free hand. He could transfer his resources from the queen side to the king side. He could double rooks. That's a really dangerous thing when you double rooks and your opponent's rooks are not doubled. He created his own pass pawn, his extra pawn mobility. His, his bishop was better than knight. King safety started to crash down. It became defenseless. A fantastic game, one of my favorite games of the match. Shall we just, just play for it quickly? Do you want a quick playthrough just, just to enjoy it again? Uh, should we just play for it quickly? Or not? Or maybe uh, I can carry on a verbal summation if you want. Um, so basically, you know, black Black's mobility, my poor mobility was, was really destroyed. His knights became more passive than the bishop. A white had a free hand. He could actually transfer his resources. He could double up rooks. He could break through. He could crack past pawn. He could then, the exchange sack was increasing the advantage. It was an easy way of increasing the advantage, just the exchange sack, because it depleted totally Black's king safety. It's it's a masterpiece on on every you know on both sides of the board. Let's, okay, let's just play it through again. Uh, with, with, with with that, I'm not going to look at any variations. I'm just going to overlay what happened. From, from the Tartakoa variation of the Queen's Gambit declined, we get these hanging pawns in the center. They become a bit immobilized because this is this was a popular variation anyway with the Queen A3. And the Bishop is now attacked with Rook A7. It was at a moment here where maybe a move like Knight F6 was important to safeguard against white playing this e4 move so this was the first kind of passive move queen f8 which led to the possibility of the hanging pawns becoming fixed here because white took on e6 and then this fixing move basically it's a very very powerful move um, which also meant that the bishop was going to be stronger than the knight and once the black pawn mobility was severely reduced you know why it's getting this free hand to play on both sides of the board well especially the king side you see black's hanging pawns extremely fixed here so white's getting this free hand to try and play on the king side and double the rooks so he's fixing even more and he's got this free hand to even play queen h3 so the resources are being transferred to the king side we have this possibility of doubling rooks, which is an ideal thing for the attacking player to, to, to do. So the rook superiority now over the opponent's rooks is starting to increase with the doubling of rooks soon. And white's e-pawn is also pretty mobile as well. Black's pawns are just fixed. It was never really in the position to play something like d3. And even a4 was played later, fixing that poor a5 pawn, as I mentioned. So black without much counterplay at all by this stage. And the intuitive battery, which is a fantastic thing, which Fisher used, a few waiting moves. The intuitive battery, it was so winning by this point that even Rook H5 was technically winning. But the intuitive battery, there's nothing to stop this build up here along this sensitive diagonal. The light squares are weak here for black around this king, the pawns on dark squares. The light squares are weak. The exchange sacrifice finishes off black's king safety. It just totally finishes off Black's king safety, this exchange sack. Black is still pretty paralyzed. White's still got this huge pawn, still got a huge bishop, still got fantastic piece coordination. All the pieces very well coordinated. Uh, so this is it. That's it. A masterpiece. Fantastic game from Fisher there in game six. Okay. 
<sighs> Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed that. So see you next week for the next game in this epic match. Have a good week.